the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, The Blank Wall. It was five o'clock, and the crowd in the locker room had slipped into the usual routine of easy chatter about wives and food and the thousand things that happen every day in a bank as busy as the Crane National. On one side, the men on the cleanup crew were getting into striped overalls with a night's work ahead of them. On the other, the guards and messengers were exchanging official navy blue bank uniforms for street clothes. To Walter Mason, though, it was a day of days. He didn't say much as he stood in front of the locker at the end of the row, half hoping the crowd would forget it and let him go his way in peace, yet wanting at the same time to stand up on a bench in the center of the room and shout it at the top of his lungs. As it turned out, however, he didn't have to make a decision. Charlie Bryson, another messenger, made it for him. Wait a minute. What's the matter, Charlie? I just happened to think. Excuse me, Joe. All right. Quiet, everybody. Hold it a minute, will you? I almost forgot. This is Walter's big night. Oh, Charlie, for the love of mine. Now, don't be bashful, (laughs) Walt. They don't care about that. Not much they don't. Want to be nice to Walt from now on, fellas? He's liable to be the boss one of these days. (laughs) (laughs) I want you to know we think it's great, Walt. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Thanks, fellas, all of you. Out at the crane place on Long Island. Oh, soup and fish, huh? <laughs> oh, yes. You know, they say there are two sure roads to success. One of them is to be smart, the other is to marry the boss's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this isn't just... Almost. Quite... We're going to keep our eye on you, Wooler. 25 years as a messenger, isn't it? Well, not quite. And I'll bet they give you a great big shiny desk less than a month after your daughter marries young Crane. <laughs> you know, Walt, it's hard to believe Mrs. Crane will take this land down. Yeah, what do you mean? No oh, you know, Donald's picture in the paper with his society gal and that one. Naturally, Mama expected him to marry one of them. Yes, but Donald had different ideas. <laughs> oh, I know that. Only in a pinch, I still bet Mama tells young Crane what to do. Wait now, you've got the kid all wrong. He's... You know him very well, Walter. Sure, he's clerking right here at the bank, isn't he? Working himself up from the bottom just like his father. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Well, Donald Crane isn't exactly working himself up. Now, wait know. a minute. <laughs> My daughter Kathy is going to marry Donald Crane. I'm happy about it, naturally. But not because he's part of that Long Island crowd. I'm happy because both Kathy and I think he's as fine a man as his father was. They don't come any better than that. That's all. So long, fellas. Walt. Yeah, Charlie. Good luck tonight. Thanks. You know, Charlie, this is going to be the greatest moment in my life. And you meant it, Walter. It's the most wonderful thing that ever happened. A party at the Crane home on Long Island, announcing Kathy's engagement to the son of Alfred Crane. And that's the missing part of the picture, Walter. It's five years now since Mr. Crane died. And you meant it when you told them he was the finest man you ever knew. 
That's why everything has to be perfect. Right down to the carnation in the lapel of your rented dinner jacket. And that's why, even though it costs $6, you ride out there in a taxi instead of the pre-war coupe in the garage at home. Yes, Walter, everything has to be right. Just right. Yes, sir? My name is Mason. I... I... Beg your pardon? I said, my name is Mason. I'm Miss Mason's father. Uh, would you mind taking my hat and coat? Oh, oh of course. Let me help you. Thank you. I'm sorry, sir. I, it was quite a shock. I... I thought I recognized you. <laughs> it's nothing. It happens all the time. I'll tell Mrs. Crane you're here. Thank you. That was strange, wasn't it, Walter? Something in the way the butler looked at you. The puzzled look in his eyes as he took your hat and coat. Walked slowly out of the reception hall. And you can't put your finger on it. All you know is that there's an unsettled, nervous feeling inside you. That somehow the man has thrown you a little off balance. You try and forget it later in the ballroom. Yes. This is something to celebrate, isn't it, Walter? And Kathy is in seventh heaven. <laughs> You're not paying much attention to your partner. What's the matter, Dad? Oh, it, it's nothing, Kathy. There's nothing to be afraid of, darling. What do you mean? Forget you work at the bank, Daddy. These people are really very nice. Oh, it's not that. You're worried about something. I can always tell. Why, it's... Just that I don't think it's right for you to go waltzing off with an old fogey like me while <laughs> Don stands around with his hands in his pockets. Do you mind, Mr. Mason? Huh? Oh, Donald. Oh, speak of the devil. I'm just like my father. Can't stand competition. <laughs> you see, Kathy? I'm only kidding. Matter of fact, Mother would like to talk to you, Mr. Mason. Oh, of course. And it's about time you two got to know each other. You know, I... I want you to be as close to her as you were to Dad. I hope so, Donald. Uh, where is she? In the library probably tapping her foot. And by the way, whatever she says, don't take it too seriously. Please sit down, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Mrs. Crane. And Sharp. Yes, ma'am. Would you bring us some coffee, please? Of course, ma'am. I want you to know, Mr. Mason, how much I admire your daughter. She's a charming girl. I'm very proud of Kathy. You have a right to be. Donald worships her, of course. I'm sure they'll be very happy. I, uh... I don't know quite how to say this, Mr. Mason. I'm afraid I'll have to put it a little bluntly. What's that, Mrs. Crane? I'm not entirely convinced it's going to work out. Donald and I have discussed it many times, but, of course, he's as stubborn as his father. What are you talking about? It's hard to reason with young people at a time like this. I opposed the marriage from the very first, but Donald is going ahead in spite of me. But I don't know what Please, you... Please, uh, let me finish. I was forced to look at this thing rather coldly. I'd prefer to stop it now rather than see Donald do something he'd regret. But wait, Mrs. Crane. Mr. You don't... Mason, there's no point in disguising facts. You must know Donald's decision came as a shock to me. When I realized that thing was serious, I took it upon myself to investigate your background quite thoroughly. You... what? I hired a private investigator. He's been working for two weeks. And he found out... what? Nothing. Otherwise, I never would have gone through with this announcement party tonight. However, until the wedding, it's not too late. And I think it's only fair to warn you that there are still some questions unanswered. My investigator seems to have run into a blank wall. He could find nothing of your whereabouts or occupation prior to the time you came to work for my husband in 1922. And what's all this got to do with Kathy and Donald? Everything. People in my position of responsibility can't be too careful, Mr. Mason. Oh, but they can, Mrs. Crane. I wish your husband were alive. I wish he could have sat in that chair over there and listened to you talk about... Well, please, Mr. What Mason. right have you to investigate me? What difference does it make where I was in 1922 or 1916 or any other time for that matter? 
You've taken a great deal upon yourself, Mrs. Crane. And if you want my frank opinion, I think your husband would have been shocked at your method. Mr. Mason. I'm sorry, I... I... Sharp. I didn't mean to intrude, madam, but you're wanted on the telephone. Thank you, Sharp. Pour Mr. Mason a cup of coffee. You will excuse me, Mr. Mason? Certainly. Why didn't you tell her the truth, Billy? Billy. Billy Ford, Sing Sing, 1916 to 22. Charge manslaughter. And don't tell me I'm wrong. I was there. Sharp. Roy Sharp. You hit me between the eyes when you walked in tonight, but I wasn't sure until a minute ago. There's a reason for the blank wall the gumshoe ran into, isn't there? I... I didn't try to fool anybody. I told Mr. Crane he helped me. He's dead. And I'm afraid the old lady hasn't got his understanding heart. You know, Billy, as of two hours ago, I started believing in miracles again. What do you mean? I'm in a spot. I need ten grand. The worst way... Now, wait a minute, Roy. You're going to get it for me. Ten thousand dollars? I can't get... But you can. By tomorrow night at ten. Crescent Bar and 58 and 3rd. I'll be there. But wait a minute. Shop! Coming, ma'am. Shop! Wait a minute, shop! I can't. The old lady's calling. But just remember to meet me tomorrow night, Billy, or some of those questions of hers won't be unanswered any longer. With the prologue of The Blank Wall, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. There were so many comments about the information I gave in last week's announcement, I'm going to repeat it tonight. As I stated, since the spring marks the 25th anniversary of the founding of Signal Oil Company, I looked up some facts which I thought would surprise you as much as they did me. And here they are. Twenty-five years ago, here in Southern California, regular gasoline sold for 23 cents per gallon without any taxes. On the other hand, in 1940, regular gasoline sold for only 18 cents per gallon, and that price included taxes of four and one-half cents per gallon, which had gradually been added. So the price of the gasoline itself, without taxes, had actually gone down about one-half. All right, now what about today's prices? Since 1940, items in the cost of living have climbed 53%, compared with an increase of only 13% in the retail price of gasoline. Get that. Since 1940, a 53% increase in the cost of living, compared with only 13% increase in the cost of gasoline. And I might add, the gallon of signal that you buy today is a vastly superior product, the finest gasoline ever offered to motorists without extra cost. So when you drive into your signal gasoline station and say, fill her up, remember you're not only getting the tops in gasoline quality, you're also getting one of the most remarkable values that your dollars still buy today. And now, back to the whistler. After 25 years, the blank wall that separated Billy Ford, ex-convict, from Walter Mason, respectable citizen, has given way. It came at a terrible moment, didn't it, Walter? And you know that one word from Sharp will put an end to the marriage of your daughter Kathy and Donald Crane. You make an excuse to Mrs. Crane, leave the party early, arrive home before midnight, and spend six hours sitting in an easy chair in the living room thinking... The morning light is gray on the windows when you rise wearily, start to put on your working clothes. There's no other way, is there, Walter? Kathy's happiness comes first now. Sharp must have his money. Well, good morning, Walter. Uh, not so good, Mr. Cromwell. I'm not feeling very well. <laughs> Too much party last night? Uh, I'm not sure, but I was wondering, Mr. Cromwell... If I felt like going home this afternoon, would it oh, be... Certainly, Walter, I understand. 
You should have phoned this morning. It wasn't necessary to come in. Well, I I thought I'd be all right. Thanks, Mr. Cromwell. Your savings account? Oh, sure. I'll give you the balance in a minute. Uh, let's see. Melford, Manning, Mason. Now, here we are. Hmm. You're a rich man, Walter. You've got exactly thirty-two hundred and six dollars and eighteen cents. Thirty-two hundred. Oh, uh, uh, thanks, Jim. Thanks a lot. Charlie, I, uh, I don't know how to ask you this exactly. What but... is it, Walt? You in some kind of trouble? Charlie, how much have you got in the bank? Huh? My savings? Yes, I. I know it isn't a nice thing to ask. Skip only it, I... skip it. It's no secret, but it's no fortune either. About 2,000 bucks. 2,000. And I know I couldn't ask you for all of it. Now. What? I should say you couldn't. The old lady'd wring my neck. How much could you let me have, Charlie? You know I'd pay it back. Huh? Oh, sure. Gosh, Walter, you're my best friend. I'd do anything for you. Only this uh, it's money... It's all right. Forget it, huh? But, Walt, there must be something I can do. No, 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 there isn't, Charlie. Just don't mention this to anyone. Please don't. Well, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. The car shows care, all right. I bought it from the original owner, and the motors had a complete overhaul. Yeah, 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 I know. Well, I guess it's worth uh, five bills. Only $500 for a car The war's over, pal. Take it or leave it. Selling your stamps. Oh, but, Mr. Mason, you've spent years... I know you're the one person who'll give me a fair price. Mr. Mason, a fair price? How can I put a price on anything like your collection? That's very nice of you, Arnold, but it's been taking up too much of my time lately, and I've decided to quit. Oh, I cannot believe that. You, you'll drop out of the society completely. Oh, no, no. What has happened? Twenty-five years is a long time to sort Please, in... Arnold, I've made up my mind. How much? What is the collection worth? If I may suggest, Mr. Mason, I would prefer to to give you the money in the form of a loan. That way I, I could keep your stamps here for a while altogether in case you change your mind. You're a very unusual man, Arnold. Oh, it is business, Mr. Mason, business. I, I just don't want to lose a good customer. I know better than that. All right, Mr. Businessman. How much of a loan can you make on it? A thousand dollars? Would that help? A, a thousand? For a little collection like... Arnold, it's a tragedy how few of us ever know our real friends. You added up, Walter, after leaving Arnold's tiny shop. Add up every cent you were able to raise. It comes to a little over 6000 Not what Sharp asked for, but you have to agree. Have to be satisfied because there's no one else you can turn to. That night at 10 o'clock, you enter the Crescent Bar. He's already there waiting. An empty cocktail glass on the table in front of him. Don't tell her. Well, hello, Billy. Please, Sharp. Huh? All right. Sit down, Walter. You're just in time to pay for the drinks. What do you have? Uh, I don't care for anything. <laughs> well, it's all right, too. But let's get to it. Did you bring the money with you? I want to talk to you about it first. No use talking about it. I just want to see it. I, uh, I can only raise 6200 I asked for ten. I thought I made it clear. It's the best I can do, Sharp. You, you don't know how much trouble it was. I don't care about that. I told you it had to be 10000 I meant it. I have uh, my troubles, too, Billy. Oh, there's nothing more I can do. Well, that's why you're wrong. I, I don't understand. Uh, maybe I shouldn't make it so easy for you. But we can get that money another way. If you're suggesting I'm not that... suggesting anything, Billy. I'm telling you what you're going to do. I've, uh, I've looked into your job at the bank. What about my job? It includes some interesting responsibilities. 
For an ex-con? The people I work for have faith in me, if that's what you mean. I'm surprised the bonding company slipped up so badly. I'm not covered by a bond. Oh? Alfred Crane was alive when I got out. He was decent enough to give me a chance. Bless him, Billy, bless him. It gives you another chance now. I don't think so. I do. I understand you'll be carrying a batch of negotiable securities tomorrow morning. What of it? You're taking them to the Lincoln Investment Company at 10.30, right? I know what you're thinking, Roy. It's no go. I'd, I'd rather they found out about me. <laughs> you're bluffing, friend. That kid of yours means more to you than anything in the world. You've got it all figured out, haven't you? I've got you figured out. That's why I'm so sure you'll cooperate tomorrow when you take that morning stroll. It doesn't seem real, does it, Walter? You wander home in a daze, and there's another sleepless night, while you tell yourself over and over that this thing can't be happening after all these years of peace. The next morning, you arrive late at the bank, still dazed, shaky, wondering what will happen when you set out for the investment company, and Roy Sharp walks up to you on the street. But you don't have to wonder long, Walter. Mr. Cromwell settles it all as you come in. Walter, we didn't expect you. Huh? Oh, sure, Mr. Cromwell. I, I'm feeling better. Charlie Bryson figured you needed a little rest. He took over for you. Took over? Well, those securities for Lincoln Investment. He's going to deliver them. What? Oh, but he doesn't have to do that. I'm perfectly able, Mr. Cromwell. I'll go tell Charlie. And suddenly you realize, Walter, how impossible the whole situation is. The phony hold-up. The inevitable question. And then Sharp coming back to you with another proposition. And another... You're certain of one thing. If Sharp were to see your friend Charlie carrying that satchel in your place, he'd never dare go through with a robbery. Instead, he'd go straight to Mrs. Crane with the whole story. And that doesn't matter anymore, does it, Walter? Because you've made a decision, an important one. Hello, Kathy. Dad, what are you doing home? I have something to tell you, dear, and there isn't much time. Sit down here, right next to me. What is it, Dad? What's happened? Kathy, you remember that young man I used to tell you about? Billy Ford. The one who went to prison? That's right. He was a nice kid, Kathy. Had some tough breaks, got into trouble, did five years in Sing Sing. I remember, but... Dad. You thought a lot of him. He died a long time ago, didn't he? I thought he did. What do you mean? Kathy... I'm Billy Ford. I used to wonder about that. Why are you telling me? Because I'm afraid everyone's going to know. Who is it, Dad? Mrs. Crane's butler, Roy Sharp. Oh, I see. Where are you going? Dad, believe me, this doesn't make any difference between us, but I want to be honest with Don now, while he has a chance to change his mind. I'm sorry, Kathy. Please, darling. It's all right. I'll go with you. No. No, I'd rather face them alone. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, here's a thought for you drivers to consider. If you had to wear heavy winter clothes right on through spring, you wouldn't feel very peppy, would you? Well, that's just how your car feels about wearing tired old winter motor oil and gear lube now that spring's here. Yes, if you want to put spring into your driving, it's high time you were treating your car to a spring changeover at your signal service station. First step is a motor drain and a refill with signal premium motor oil, the new type lubricant that guarantees you a sweeter running motor by keeping motors six times cleaner and reducing cylinder wear one-third. Next step is fresh signal gear lube for transmission and differential and a signal double-check lubrication for the chassis. And at the same time, your signal dealer will be glad to check those other points that need attention every five or 10,000 miles, such as air cleaner, oil filter, or front wheel bearings. Man, a car just can't help feeling peppier after a spring tonic like this. 
So give your car a break. See your neighborhood signal dealer this week for a signal spring changeover. And now, back to the whistler. So she's gone now, Walter. And you sit alone in the living room, exhausted, numb, filled with a black kind of despair that blots out everything else. Yes, Kathy's gone to tell the man she loved. Her father was a criminal, an ex-convict. There was no other way. The terrible coincidence that placed you and Roy Sharp at the same party ended all hope. Yes, at that moment, the blank wall was breached, and Billy Ford and Walter Mason became one and the same man. You find yourself staring at the black butt of your thirty-eight revolver lying on the living room table. The gun you would have carried this morning if Charlie Bryson hadn't taken your place. At one point, you start to reach for it and decide that's never the answer. You aren't conscious of time, but it's past noon when you decide it wasn't fair to let Kathy face them alone. And an hour later, you walk into the library of the Crane home on Long Island. As you expected, Mrs. Crane is terribly upset. I told you so, Donald. I suspected that man from the first. Now, wait a minute, Mother. Really, Mrs. Crane, it won't do any good Please, to us. Please, Catherine, you don't understand. They'll pounce on this like a flock of vultures. The papers, the tabloids, everyone. Now, just a minute. Maybe I Dad. can... I'm sorry, Kathy. It wasn't fair of me to Wait a minute, you... Dad. What? What's the matter? Donald, show him the paper. Sure. Here you are, Mr. Mason. Attempted robbery. Broad daylight. It's the butler here, Dad. He was killed this morning in a gunfight on Broad Street. He tried to rob one of the messengers from the bank. Sharp. Killed. Gunfight. Wait a minute. Charlie Bryson. What about Charlie? Charlie? The messenger. He was the one who... I'll get it. Roy Sharp. Then he didn't... No, Mr. Mason. He didn't. You... You know. She told me. And your mother? All she knows is uh, it's for you, what Mr. she reads in the Mason. papers. Uh, Charlie, somebody. Charlie? Oh, uh, uh, thanks. Yes, Charlie. Are you all right? All right. I'm a hero. Reward money and everything. I couldn't wait to call you, Walt. Oh? About that money. If you still need it, brother, I've got it. No, Charlie. Thanks, but everything's all right now. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 9. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Charles Seal and Jack Petruzzi. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.